Hi guys, welcome to Presume Legal. I'm Misha Janice. Thanks for joining me today as we continue in our series, Justice for Dan Markell. But before we begin, did you miss me? I feel like I've been gone because I haven't done a video in this series for over a week, I think. I was actually on spring break with, uh, with my son. My husband took some days off from work and we went camping for the very first time, believe it or not. We're not camping people, but maybe we are now. I don't know. We visited Blue Springs State Park in Central Florida, stayed in a cabin on the park premises and did the whole shebang with campfires and s'mores and firefly walks and of course enjoying the springs and the wildlife, which is not normally in my wheelhouse of stuff that I enjoy doing. Not really a natural naturey, you know feet in the grass type of girl. But this trip was totally out of my comfort zone. But I'm really glad that we went and that I was able to, or we were able to show my son something different. I can't wait for our next adventure. Oh, also on spring break, my son went to the dentist for the first time. So I remember when I had asked you guys for your good thoughts and anticipation of him seeing the dentist for the very first time. Well, he did an awesome job. Let me tell you, no tears, no whining, just courage and bravery. I was such a proud mama. So thank you for all of the encouraging comments that all of you friends left for us. Let's get into today's topic. So the year 2000, what do you remember about it? I feel like the biggest thing leading up to it was the whole Y2K debacle. You know, when there was widespread anxiety that computer systems all over the world would fail and cause massive disruptions to life as we knew it. In the end, at the stroke of midnight, nothing happened and life went on as normal. Well, in the year 2000, Wendy Adelson was a student at Brandeis University in Massachusetts. She majored in peace and conflict studies and graduated magna cum laude the following year with a Bachelor of Arts. But in the year 2000, Wendy was awarded a Truman Scholarship. The Truman Scholarship is a prestigious award aimed at supporting and developing future leaders in public service. It was established in 1975 to honor President Harry S. Truman, who, fun fact, did not hold a college degree. But the scholarship seeks to identify and nurture individuals with exceptional leadership potential and a commitment to making a positive impact on society. The scholarship is awarded to about 60 students each year based on their academic excellence, leadership qualities, and potential to contribute meaningfully to public service. Recipients of the Truman Scholarship receive funding for graduate studies and access to leadership development programs and opportunities for internships and networking within the public service sector. Suffice it to say, the recipients of the Truman Scholarship are bright students who have great potential for doing amazing things in the public service sector. And I don't just mean true crime. But here we have Wendy Adelson as a recipient of this scholarship, and we know her platform is all about human trafficking. Now, I don't know that she was devoted to human trafficking back in the year 2000, but her resume does speak to her being involved with issues of public concern. So there was a resume that I found online purporting to be Wendy's. I think I found it on, on an FSU website, actually, and it looks legit, so let's pretend that it is. In the years leading up to Wendy's Truman Scholarship Award, the resume lists her as being the founder and president of Starting Blocks, a service organization that provided over $18,000 worth of educational material to underfunded daycare centers, a coordinator for the Big Siblings Program, that provided over 50 at-risk youth with siblings. And she was also a volunteer at Peace and Justice Service Camp for abused and neglected children. So she was definitely very involved in community and service-based projects. And for that, I commend her. But I do wonder whether she was truly altruistic or if her volunteerism and service was maybe for other motives. Maybe it's the case where she started out as pure, you know, purely altruistic. And over time, it developed into a personality that was much more sinister. 
In 2014, so 14 years after receiving the scholarship, Wendy was, enter was interviewed and an article was published by the Truman Scholars Association. The article titled Know Your Scholars, Wendy Adelson, 2000 Florida, was published on April 6, 2014. So well after the divorce was finalized and in the midst of the custody battle and only a few months before her husband, her ex-husband, Dan Markell was killed. The article begins with the author giving a brief synopsis of Wendy's, in my opinion, semi-autobiographical novel. How it was chosen is featured reading at FSU and how Wendy was due to speak at the new student convocation ceremony in August. She was asked how she came to be a lawyer and how she arrived at FSU. Now, word on the street is that she arrived at FSU because of Dan Markell. Yeah, he allegedly negotiated a position for his then wife, Wendy, when he was offered a law professorship. He said, I'm a package deal, you take me, you have to give her something as well. How chivalrous is that? Now, look, I'm no hopeless romantic, not at all. But there's something about a man who'll fight and stand up for his wife that's mm, just so sweet. With her background, I don't know why she couldn't get a job on her own merits, but I digress. So here are Wendy's words in first person, giving some of her background, how she came to want to practice the law and how she ended up working at FSU. She says, in college, I was looking for any way to learn Spanish so that I could connect with more people. I got a fellowship to work with families of the disappeared post dirty war in Argentina. During that work in Buenos Aires in the summer of 1999, I met Adolfo Perez Esquivel, who is a Nobel Peace Prize winner. I started spending two days a week with him at his camp for kids. I would wake up at 5.30 in the morning and wait for him for a while on a cold subway platform. When he arrived, we would drive for two hours each way out to the campo to connect with 15 or so kids, teach them computers and life lessons, and then head back to the city. During that time with Adolfo, I was so impressed with the way that he worked with individual people, but also spent time traveling around the world giving talks on the movement against violence. I realized then that I wanted to develop a skill set that I could use to help individual people, but also to advance larger policies. I thought law was a good tool for social change to use in that regard. I screwed up fantastically and ended up with a dream job as a clinical law professor. I fell in love with the wrong man. I fell in love with the wrong man and he got a job in Tallahassee. I had wanted to be in DC or become a foreign service officer or in the previous few years, live closely to my family in South Florida. So ill-fated romance took me to Tallahassee and my love and love for my children keeps me here. My children are three and four, 14 months apart. Much of the last four years has been a giant blur. They are my heart walking around outside of my body and every decision related to my career has been made with them in mind. I was offered my dream job of directing an immigration clinic in another city when I was seven months pregnant with my older son and I turned it down because I didn't know what his needs would be when he was born or how being a mother would change my perspective on work and family. And now I've received offers for more lucrative employment, but not with the same kind of flexibility. And so I turned them down as well, because what matters most to me today is that I can spend the most amount of quality time with my lovies. Wow. Lots to unpack here. But this is a firsthand Wendy from Wendy point of view speaking on a number of things. Wendy, how did you feel about Dan? I screwed up. I fell in love with the wrong man. Wendy, where do you rather want to be? In DC or a foreign service officer or close to my family in South Florida. Wendy, why are you still in Tallahassee? It's only the love of my kids keeping me here. Interestingly, she talks about amazing job offers she's received in other cities, 
one when she was pregnant. She says that the only reason she turned it down was because of her uncertainty about motherhood, not because of Dan, her husband at the time, not because he would have objected or would have had to uproot himself. So if she had had more certainty about motherhood, what would have happened? She had moved to a new city with her and just her baby and Dan stay in Tallahassee. It's unclear whether she blames her kids or her location caused by Dan for not accepting these dream job offers. It seems like a little bit of both to me. The author then asked Wendy to explain a little bit about the medical legal partnership. She says, the medical legal partnership is a clinical legal program, which means that we use experiential learning. We partner with a local community health clinic and represent homeless, indigent, undocumented, and physically, mentally ill persons with their petitions for disability and immigration legal services to teach law students how to practice law. Students do every aspect of a case from performing intake, doing research and filing applications and petitions and advocating for a client in administrative court. This past week, we advocated with various senators and representatives for Medicaid expansion in Florida. We brought one of the clients who falls within the coverage gap to show the senators slash representatives who voted against expansion the human face that loses when they make political choices. I also run an alternative spring break program where law and medical students provide legal assistance to migrant farm workers and their families and learn about the impact of farm work on individual and family health and how the law can impact other social determinants of health. This time, our students went to one of the parking lots where workers congregate for work at 5.30 a.m. and we talked with a crew leader about her life and her work as a young migrant farm worker and as an adult crew leader. Wendy was asked about her motivation to write her, in my opinion, semi-autobiographical book. This is our story. And uh, she wrote, quote, as a clinical law professor, I sometimes feel like a reluctant academic. Hmm, poor little Tink Tink. The idea of being an academic inspires visions of the ivory tower where conversations about the law take place amongst lofty people with powdered wigs. I mean, no offense to the British. I am focused on real world legal practice, largely around the issue of immigration. Thus, most often when someone asks me what I do for a living, I respond, public interest lawyer or immigration lawyer, but the good kind that doesn't rip people off. It is important to me to describe what I do in terms of its relation to the clients we serve, the community at large, and the inherent opportunity to serve the public good. Okay, so here I'm left wondering whether she ever respected Dan since he was an academic through and through. Her stating that she is focused on real world legal practice is definitely a dig at academia since most Full-time law professors don't or no longer practice law day to day. My impression is that she looked down on those in academia as not real lawyers, but pompous, lofty people who probably think very highly of themselves. And yet she equates her position as a clinical law professor with being in academia like Dan. They're not the same thing. But she only does that to distinguish herself from them. It's like, I'm like them, but I'm so much better because I actually help people and the community and I actually serve the public good. Not like those other people in academia. They, they don't do any of that. They just talk. So circa 2008, when I was working as an immigration attorney at the Florida State University Center for the Advancement of Human Rights, a lofty title for a building with a dilapidated staircase into the old house term organization and an office barely big enough to house the hot water heater that sat next to my desk. I discovered that there was an inconsistency in the laws that favor children who were victims of trafficking, but seemingly mischaracterized kids that had been prostituted as criminals. I thought this was very interesting and I still do 
But as I sat down to write an article on the more on the esoteric differences in these laws, I discovered that what I wanted to do was tell my clients stories and mine, i.e. what it means to be a public interest lawyer to a broader audience. So is it curious, or am I overthinking this? Is it curious that she went into detail describing the building that she worked in? Again, she uses that term lofty to describe the title of the job she worked at in contradiction to the office building that she worked out of, a dilapidated old structure with tiny offices that share utilities. I really need a psychologist to analyze why does she include these details? Was it to further herself from being seen as an academic? Was it to victimize herself or to portray herself as a saint? Like, woe is me working in this dump of an office, but I'm doing it for the public good to rescue poor children from, from trafficking. Again, I don't know, pure speculation, but I'd love to hear insight on this from a professional in particular. If you are one, leave me a comment down below. For the, for the previous few years, I had represented abused immigrant women, immigrant children who fled violence and abuse at home, persecuted people seeking asylum, and victims of human trafficking. Instead of writing an article for a legal publication, primarily read by legal academics and practitioners, no offense meant to the legal scholars out there, yeah, right? I wanted to write my clients' stories. I wanted to give voice to a population that often has none. I wanted, to, I wanted people to know how criminals and traffickers exploit human vulnerabilities, what the experience of being trafficked is actually like, and the struggle to piece together broken lives when and if it ends. I wrote this novel, putting in hours each day for two years, finishing just before my first son was born. I then spent the next two years trying to find an agent or a publisher to no avail and gave birth to my second son during that time while continuing to work. Finally, in 2011, I decided to self-publish. The chance to publish with an academic publisher came in, in 2012. Now in 2014, I am thrilled that my novel, This Is Our Story, has been selected by Florida State University for their One Book, One Campus initiative. Over the summer, 7,000 incoming freshmen will engage with the issue of human trafficking by reading and discussing my book. This is both an honor and an opportunity to educate students on this deeply important issue. I'm hopeful that being exposed to my clients' stories will make an impact on the class of 2018. Maybe one of these fresh people will pursue a career in mental health and provide services to trafficked persons recovering from trauma. Perhaps some of the law students that I teach at Tallahass in Tallahassee, Florida, will also represent victims of human trafficking. These possibilities make me less of a reluctant academic because they represent the possibility that the modern university can fuel real world social change. Maybe one day when my boys are no longer in diapers, they will bring me to school for career day, proud that their mom is a clinical law professor. So here we get a timeline of her book. She finished writing it just before her older son, Benjamin, was born. He was born in July 20, 2009, I believe. She couldn't find an agent or a publisher for her book, so in 2011, she self-published it. The following year, Carolina Academic Press agreed to publish the book, and it did, it, did that in 2013. So final thoughts on this interview that was published just a few short months before Dan's murder. For me, it provides more insight into Wendy's mental state when she was in Tallahassee, her motives and her life goals for the future. Lucky for her, her dreams came true shortly thereafter when she was able to get away from the wrong man that she fell in love with. She was able to move close to her family in South Florida just like she wanted, and she was able to spend all the quality time with her lovies that she wanted to. And she didn't have to be a reluctant academic or a clinical law professor anymore. So she really got everything she wanted in the end. So that's the lesson here, kids. Never give up on your dreams. That's all I have for you today. Make sure you're hitting those like and subscribe buttons on your way out. 
I'll see you all next time. Until the next drop. Peace.